It's a pleasure to be here. It, it really is a pleasure to be uh, in this setting and speaking to you. And a, a pleasure to have old friends in the audience as well. <clears throat> I begin with a sentence from the British historian John Coffey's recent book, Persecution and Toleration in Protestant England, 1558-1689, quote, for most of this period, the English state can be described as a persecuting state. A little chilling, yes? So I, I warn you, <laughs> I warn you that uh, there's not a lot of laughs in what I'm gonna talk about this evening. Not that I'm gonna talk about persecution per se, quite the opposite, but I've had to forego humor. Not a, not a funny subject, the subject of toleration and persecution. But I hope I can demonstrate to you, for you as a historian, just how complex or complicated the relationship between conscience and the civil state was in the 17th century Anglo-American world with New England as my particular focus this evening. As a historian, I find myself drawn to contradictions. From my angle of vision, political and religious cultures in the past should be understood not as tightly bounded, even coherent systems, that was in a sense the point of the Book of Worlds of Wonder, but as framed around tensions or perhaps contradictions that at some historical moments can be avoided, at others temporarily overcome or suspended, and at others erupt in serious conflict and division. The most famous of these, for those of you who know the 17th century, it's really a world famous example, at least in a certain setting, is the contradiction between Stuart monarchs, monarchs in early 17th century England, asserting a virtually unchecked royal prerogative, my power is absolute, a relatively quiescent parliament that accepted most of the monarch's claims, but protested others, especially when it came to money matters. And then to everyone's astonishment, a civil war that broke out in 1642, the English Civil War, that ended with the execution of Charles I, the king. Much less celebrated or well known is the contradiction implied in Co Coffey's, John Coffey's qualifying most, most of the time, England was a persecuting society. I want to comment briefly on that sentence and then take up two overlapping contradictions that really interest me. The first, more briefly, between royal policy in the 17th century and Puritanism. The second, within the ideology of Puritanism itself, once it was transplanted to these shores. Before I begin on these interlocking and, and sequential contradictions, I want to just call to your attention a change of thinking among historians of early modern Europe about tolerance and toleration. The newer work challenges a narrative that, again, in a sense, everyone is familiar with or implicitly familiar with. That is that there are a series of heroic figures, people like John Milton and most important, most ordinarily centered in this story, John Locke, heroic figures who, who opposed the then uh, policy of religious uniformity, that everyone had to be the same, and the consequences of that policy, which was the, in fact, suppression of dissent and persecution of some people. That story, well known, still re-articulated in, in, in scholarship, but dates back 70 or 80 years, if not to the 19th century itself has now been challenged by work that includes John Coffey's book, and even more emphatically and interestingly in a book from which I took the opening words of my title, Alexandra Walsham, a British historian's book, Charitable Hatred, Tolerance and Intolerance in England, 1500 to 1700. And then there's work on continental Europe as well that I, that I, that I can speak about in the question period if you want to hear about it. All this work is congruent in that it argues that toleration, I'm sorry, tolerance 
existed before toleration. That is, before there was a theory of toleration, a theory of how society should be organized around toleration, there was on the ground practice of tolerance in substantial ways. And the reasons there was such tolerance, these historians argue, is that the authorities, those in charge, be they state, be they church, those in charge realized that the price of sustaining uniformity, that is, the price of the uniformity that all state churches in early modern Europe insisted upon, with the possible exception of the Netherlands, was so high that it was better to look the other way. In other words, that killing lots of people, or putting lots of people in prison, or exiling lots of people was just too high, high a price to pay. This, by, by the way, is a lesson the French state never learned until it was way too late. And second, the second lesson of this work teaches us that even if or even when the highest reaches of state and church tried to sustain compulsory religion, at the local level, sheriffs, magistrates, town governments dragged their feet in ways that severely weakened the implementing of any such policy. Let me just digress for a moment to New England. The same practice, the same uh, contrast between stated policy and practice occurred here in terms of the Baptists and the Quakers who were in general being condemned by the civil state in Massachusetts, not in the other colonies so much. And so the civil state passed laws imposing very substantial fines on people who practiced their Quakerism or practiced their baptism, in other words, refused to come to the official church. And they sent the order down to the local constable to impose these fines. Looking in local records, people have learned that the local constable didn't really want to impose these fines for a simple reason. To impoverish a particular family would place them on the welfare rolls of the town. It was not that they were out of the town, they were still in the town. Moreover, there were kinship networks that would be involved that would again agitate the politics of the town. So, on the, so the finding then shows, and this would be true all throughout Europe, that what the official records suggest was happening is not actually was ha what was happening in local levels. And then there's a third point to make, which is uh, going back to the title of Alexander Walsh's book that I've borrowed, Charitable Hatred, a wonderful paradox in and of itself. Walsh says, suppose we take seriously the arguments for uniformity rather than dismissing them as outdated rubbish. And I won't walk, walk you through. We can again pick that up perhaps in the question period. How she, uh, in a certain sense, sympathetically, I mean, she's not sympathetic to it ideologically, but sympathetic to it as an historian, tries to reconstruct the policies of the state and what made sense from that point of view. So just to say this one more time, uh, tolerance before toleration, basically the point is that the mechanisms for enforcing state policy were simply too weak. And you may say, well, Walsham, Coffey, Hall, whoever, gee, weren't there a lot of executions taking place in England or elsewhere in the 17th and 16th centuries? And of course, most famously, when the Catholic Mary Tudor was head of the English state and almost 300 people were were in fact executed by, by fire. And the answer is precisely that most or yes, but. Because in fact, if we leave aside the extreme example of Bloody Mary, who has never been rehabilitated by historians and is not likely to be, most periods of Tudor Stuart rule saw very, very few executions. And those that did occur were mostly a people convicted of sedition, not heresy. Actually, one of my ancestors was convicted and was, was hanged. Uh, Queen Elizabeth always said she didn't mean to have him hanged, but hanged, hanged he actually was. Again, we can return to this aspect of things in the question period. Now to the heart of what I want to talk about here today. Virtually every thinking person in early modern Europe believed that unless something they called authority 
were sustained, social peace would collapse and anarchy prevail. In this vein of thinking, what made authority effective, what it needed to be effective, was hierarchy. The few on top must rule over the many beneath them, not rule in an arbitrary or unjust way. The few on top were supposed to act on behalf of the common good, and those on, underneath were not simply obeying out of the sheer obedience, but obeying in order to accomplish as well the common good. Authority and obedience were tied together in terms of obligation. And the great benefit of everyone sharing the sense of obligation, everyone sharing our respect for authority, was the capacity of authority to unite divergent social groups, to unite all the different interests that existed in any early modern society into a true commonwealth, a harmony of peoples. And so from this period, again and again, commentators who are articulating this perspective on authority will liken this, this, the civil state or the church to a ship at sea. And who is piloting the ship? Who is piloting the ship? The ship will sink unless it is properly piloted with someone who has effective authority. Or they'll quote, as Abraham Lincoln did many, many years later, Matthew 12, 25, in warning that a house divided against itself cannot stand. How do you overcome, how does a society overcome division of interests? It is, of course, precisely the question we face in a very, very poignant, powerful way right now in American society, American political history. Without a center, without obedience to a higher authority, without sovereignty, no society could ward off, as one English minister of the early 17th century said, this is a bit rhetorical, but people were rhetorical, adulteries, incests, robberies, savage cruelty, all of which he predicted would overflow the earth were there not explicit, clear authority. And it's interesting to turn in this context to one of the English kings, not the one who lost his head, but the father of the one who lost his head, James I. James I reasoned, by the way, who, who bought into this theory of authority and of kingship as, as preserving a kind of harmonious, peaceful society. And by the way, in the background here, of course, are all the, the feuds of the late medieval period that meant there was no effective central authority. James I bought into this theory, and he also reasoned that religious uniformity, uniformity in religion, was critical to sustaining his own authority. A state church, hierarchically organized, that is, with bishops, the Church of England, a church that uh, uh, drew much of its structure from Catholicism, the Church of England, with its bishops, was, he said, necessary to sustain his own authority, as was uniformity. And some of you can immediately quote back to me the line that he uttered in 1604, no bishop, no king. Nice little aphorism that sums up his view that hierarchy in the church mimics or supports hierarchy in civil society, and both are necessary for the good of the whole. Now James detested in his own, all around him, there were people who said, wait a minute, James, we don't, we don't agree with your assumption, actually. And he detested these folks. Some of them were Catholics. Actually, he, he, he kind of got along with the Catholics, paradoxically enough. But he really, really, really disliked the Puritans. He thought they were seditious types, just desperate to subvert his authority desperate to subvert his authority, and in fact, attempting to assert his authority, subvert his authority, because they were criticizing the Church of England. To him, they were visibly agents of sedition. And so there was a contradiction. Here's the first contradiction in brief. The contradiction between the public, the official ideology of English society, not just represented by James I, but articulated and re-articulated all over the place, 
that uniformity was good, hierarchy was good, authority was necessary, subordination and obedience were crucial, and the fact that a dissident group did arise in England, Protestants, Protestants who wanted to dismantle the particular structure of the Church of England, and especially clerical hierarchies. James did not like this. Now, some of these people came here to Massachusetts and then spread out across New England in the 1620s and 1630s, founding colonies that where they, th where they were safe from the Stuart Kings, the Stuart Kings, they were beyond the reach of the Stuart Kings, so they could pretty much do what they wanted to do. Now, if I were to ask, I'm not gonna do this, <laughs> but if I were to ask you for a show of hands, most of you would probably assent to the proposition that the colonists created or recreated the persecuting society they had left behind. So our common culture teaches us, familiar litany, Roger Williams pleading liberty of conscience, forced to leave Massachusetts, or perhaps you know that four Quakers were executed on Boston Common in 1660-61, or that, of course, witches were hanged, all that has nothing to do with religious persecution per se. And maybe you could, if we were to explore this further, you would realize that behind this notion of New England as a persecuting society in the 17th century lies a sense that Calvinism, Calvinistic theology, this was said many, many times over the 19th century and is still reiterated to this day, that Calvinistic theology was terrifyingly authoritarian because of its image of God as so supreme, so absolute in his authority, and terrifying too in how these self-righteous, self-assured ministers and lay leaders drew on this notion of, the, of, of divine action, divine presence, divine being. And here it's worth just recalling something that all of you know, again, at least by allusion, if not directly, and that, that's Nathaniel Hawthorne's novel, The Scarlet Letter, which is about a woman who has been convicted of adultery, and I'm gonna turn, turn to adultery more fully in a moment or two here. And in its opening pages, there's a really a wonderfully evocative picture of a crowd of women waiting for Hester Prynne to emerge from the jail. She will be wearing for the first time in public her scarlet letter. This crowd of women dressed in gloomy shades of brown and gray, which is not what they would have been wearing in the 17th century, and who, from Hawthorne's point of view, in terms of their attitude, their stance, they embody a righteousness, a self-righteousness, devoid of all human sympathy or as Hawthorne would put it, heart, and they're going to do their best to exclude Hester Prynne from their community. And that image resonates with us strongly. So our common knowledge, our common presumption, our everyday working knowledge starts from the presumption that the Puritans who came here were somehow or other singularly oppressive people singularly unable to allow dissent and quite willing, quite willing to put to death people who dissented or to exile them or punish them in some fashion. Now, this ain't the truth about them. It just so happens that our common wisdom is inaccurate, entrenched, but inaccurate. So let me turn now to what they said. And then we'll, and, and a kind of contradiction here is between that image or that figure, that trope of them as authoritative and what I'm about to say. And then I'll explore some contradictions in what they did say. So I invite you to listen to voices from 17th century New England describing the relationship between conscience and church or church and civil state. I begin with the most important of the ministers to address these themes, and Roger Williams' most important adversary in, in New England, he had other adversaries in, in England, a man named John Cotton, a minister here in Boston, 
a moderate Puritan until he came here. And then the major architect, the major architect of the church system that the colonists created, which they called the Congregational Way and we call more simply Congregationalism. And you'll hear some more about Congregationalism here in a moment. Now Cotton, John Cotton was drawn to the last book in the Christian Bible, the New Testament. He was drawn to the book of Revelation and he spent a great deal of time in, in the, the, toward the end of the 1630s preaching on the book of Revelation. He viewed this undoubtedly the most obscure, the most cryptic book in the entire Bible with its references to beasts, trumpets, seals, horsemen, the numbers, numerology, 666 and the like. He viewed this book, he read this book which he thought was just immensely important to understanding the history of Christianity. He read this book through the lens of anti-Catholicism, drawing as he did so on a history of tradition, a tradition of interpretation that included the great 16th century martyrologist, English martyrologist, John Fox. And here's what Cotton said, I'm gonna quote him now in some ways. He called upon the colonists in these sermons, he opens these sermons, he calls upon the colonists to raise up their hearts in holy thankfulness to God that they have been delivered from the great beast of Roman Catholicism. You'd have to know the book of Revelation more, more, clear, more fully than I can play it out here, understand the implications of the word beast. Here he intended not only the actual Church of Rome when he condemned Catholicism, but the Romanizing tendencies he discerned in the Church of England of his own time. That is, it was felt that the, that the English Church was being gradually made more and more Catholic, which is also true. The central theme of the sermon series, once he turned away from pure explication, was power. What is just power, just uses of power? What are unjust uses of power? How is power limited? How is it unlimited? with the papacy always standing in as an entity or a source of claims for absolutely unlimited power over churches, over civil societies, over the consciences of, consciences of Christians, whether that is true or not is another question, but that's what he saw it, as contrasted with what he described as the meekness and simplicity of the apostolic church, the true church, its leaders exercising a merely ministerial authority, its communities enjoying liberty, and the churches as a whole renouncing any role in civil government. Appropriate to an exegesis of Revelation, Cotton sketched a politics of authority, a politics of authority rooted in a story of war between the saints and the forces allied with Antichrist, the Antichrist, and Satan. And what's interesting is, what's important in terms of biblical exegesis and then political theology is how he dated this war. And for him it began in the fourth century, fourth century AD, the Christian era when despite the seeming triumph of Christianity under the Emperor Constantine, when Constantine declared that Christianity would be the official religion of the West, when despite that seeming triumph of Christianity, the true saints had fled into the wilderness. And this again is a piece of the book of Revelation. And then Cotton says, he tells us that for centuries thereafter, right until the beginning of the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, a saving remnant, a tiny group of people had undergone great sacrifice and suffering, suffering to hold on to the nucleus of apostolic Christianity. Cotton drew two lessons from this reading of Christian history. First, that the saints, the saints, the few who were the saints were always and everywhere under attack by the forces allied with the cryptic, obscure figure of the Antichrist. And second, 
a more hopeful note. The day was coming when, as prophesied in Isaiah and Daniel and the book of Revelation, the tyranny of the Antichrist would finally be overthrown and give way to a church purified of all corruption and accepting Christ as its authentic, solitary head. So a narrative then of Christian history which looks back on, on untold periods of suffering on the part of the saints and then looks forward to a, 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 an overthrow of that suffering, an ending of most of that suffering. And he dates this as happening in his own century, as did others before him. And then the people who listened to these sermons, and they were published so people could read them as well, the people who were listening to these sermons heard him say that here in New England, and New England is a, a bunch of you know, ratty wooden houses and dirty roads and pigs running around everywhere and people struggling to make a living and come over here. Here in New England, churches, pe people and ministers, colonists and ministers had collaborated to, to advance this project of restoring the church that was the true church, the very church as practiced by the apostles and the early, early Christians, the church he calls the Congregational Way. And why was it so important to have the Congregational Way? Or what was so significant about the Congregational Way? It was very simple from God's point of view. It was very simple. First, there's absolutely no hierarchy in the Congregational Way. All ministers are of exactly the same rank. No minister has more.